and tennis. In this nugget, we're going to take a look at the magic of how an antenna can take the energy available from an access point and focus it over a given area. Let's begin. I'd like you to imagine that you and I have joined forces to do wireless implementations and the company that owns this wireless space has hired us to implement a wireless local area network. Before we ever set foot into this facility or see the blueprint, we already know a couple of things. Number one, we're going to use an access point because that's how we do infrastructure mode with access points. And secondly, that access point is going to need some type of an antenna to radiate or generate that signal that's going to be propagated through the wireless space. So let's take a look at a moment at the access point. So here we have an access point, and if it has a single antenna, it would look like that, perhaps. Sometimes an antenna is external, sometimes an antenna would be internal to the unit, depends on the type of device. And if it's an insect, like a bug, <laughs> and it has two antenna, they would call it antennae. But for an antenna that's on a radio, if we have more than one antenna, they call it antennas, like that. So what's going to happen is this access point is actually generating a signal that's being forwarded to this antenna or perhaps that antenna. There's something called diversity where it could choose to use one over the other based on the best and clearest signal. And then that signal is generated and propagated out of that antenna. And a couple of, of details regarding describing that signal that's being generated is the H plane and the E plane. Let's talk about those for a moment. Let's imagine we have an access point and we're putting it right here. And I want you to picture this view. So we're looking down on the office space. If we are considering the H plane or the, the radiated signal that's going off of that access point from a top view looking down at it, that's referred to as the H plane. You can think of that as the horizontal plane where the signal goes horizontally. And with an omnidirectional antenna, it's going to go out in every direction. And then as it starts hitting doors and starts getting absorbed and reflected, the signal can weaken. So this would represent the H plane. Just visualize looking down at the office space, looking down at the access point from the center of it, how far it radiates out, that would be the H plane. And guess what? Good news. We can categorize this power, how much signal strength we're sending out, and we can use DBM for that with decibels in relationship to milliwatts. So you might be saying, okay, Keith, great. How far it goes out horizontally, that's the H plane. Let's take a guess at the E plane. What is that all about? Well, the E plane would be if we're looking at the side. For example, let's say this is the antenna on our access point and we're looking at it from the side. The E plane would be the radiation or how the signal goes from us looking across at the actual antenna as opposed to H plane, which is on the top view. So from this perspective, as far as how tall the signal is emitted and so forth, that'd be one of the things we can see from the E plane. Now to really get the full picture of what's happening, we'd have to combine the information from the H plane, that's horizontally, and the E plane. And that would give us the full picture of the radiated power that's being sent by this antenna. A lot of times we want to think, you know, more is better. And a lot of times that's true. However, in the country where you live, there's a regulatory body that's going to specify how much power we can actually emit. And they call that the EIRP, the effective isotropic radiated power that's being sent from your access point with its associated antenna or antennas. Now the maximum number has a lot of variables, including the part of the world that you live in and what governing body you have, but the FCC in the US, where I happen to be, many of the limitations are set at 36 dBm as far as the EIRP is concerned. Now that's not for every single application, but for a lot of wireless it is in the US. In other countries it may be lower or higher. You don't want to check with your local regulatory board to find out what those limits are. But what I think is interesting is that it's not just the power that's being generated by your access point. For example, let's say we have an access point and it's actually generating 30 dBm. And then it goes to the antenna. And when the antenna actually changes that from electrical current into an electromagnetic wave and it's being sent, there's actually a gain. Antenna gain is significantly different than what you might think. For example, it's not the same as an amplifier gain. An antenna doesn't have a power source all by itself that allows that antenna to create additional energy to boost the signal. Antenna gain refers to taking the energy given to it from the access point and then focusing it over a certain area. So antenna gain is primarily the amount of focus that the antenna is going to apply to that incoming signal as it sends it out. 
the antenna gain is referenced as dbi so dbm with power as it relates to milliwatts is the power being sent to the antenna and the antenna gain which is based on the type and format of the antenna is referred to as dbi the i standing for isotropic so for example if the signal the transmit signal was at 30 dbm and then we had an antenna that had a 6 dbi gain the effective isotropic radiated power would be approximately 36 dbm there may be a small amount of loss due to the cable and the attenuation of the signal as it goes between the access point and the antenna especially if it's an antenna that's connected via a very long cable so we could subtract a little bit of db for cable loss but that's the formula and that's one i would recommend you jot down transmit power from the access point plus the antenna gain minus any cable loss if there is any that is the formula for effective isotropic radiated power another term that we might come across is dbd and dbd refers to a decibel gain in relation to a dipole antenna the dipole antenna has a gain of 2.15 dbi so where this comes into play is if you're looking at antennas and they say you know what this antenna has a 4.9 dbd and you might be asking okay so it's 4.9 dbd but what is that in dbi the dbi is going to be 2.15 higher than the listed dbd so in this case if we want to find out the equivalent dbi we'd say 4.9 plus the gain of 2.15 and i'll put the zero up here just for nice order keeping that'd be five that'd be a zero carry the one that'd be seven our effective dbi here would be 7.05 so the math on that is pretty simple anytime you're given a gain for an antenna of dbd simply add 2.15 to it to find out the equivalent dbi for that antenna Two big classifications for antennas would be unidirectional and omnidirectional. For example, this guy right here is an omnidirectional antenna. So if we're considering the H-plane and that antenna was right here, the radiated power would go out in all directions, mostly equally to begin with. And then as it starts hitting obstacles and becomes absorbed and reflected, it wouldn't be as strong perhaps in this back office because of the walls involved. But the antenna on its own power is sending signals out in all directions. That's a omnidirectional antenna. The other side of that coin is a unidirectional antenna. For example, let's say that we have a parking lot right here or another building and we don't want our signals to be very strong in that area to help avoid eavesdropping, somebody trying to hack our wireless network, etc. What we could do is use a unidirectional antenna and put it here, for example, that radiated only this way. And as long as our RSSI over at this end was strong enough for these devices to pick up on that, that would be a great solution because there would be very little, if any, signals that are going back into the parking lot or this area where we don't want our signals to be radiated. The magic of them creating these antennas deals quite a bit with the shape of the antenna and also the polarity. Our goal is to make sure we choose the correct antenna for the business need at hand. And one of the most important aspects of getting the right type of coverage is to do a site survey on the premises. So for example, if we think we're gonna use omnidirectional, we might put one here and measure the RSSI everywhere just to make sure the signal strength is strong enough. Now, if the area is too big, we might say, you know what? One AP is not gonna cover it. We need to go ahead and use a couple of APs. We put one here, maybe we put one here, and then we do our testing just to verify the R. SSI is strong enough at every point in the office where they want the coverage. Another thing to consider too is that if the office is completely empty, we may want to be aware that after they put in filing cabinets and human beings and chairs and everything else, so we'd want to take that into consideration to make sure that the final design is actually going to work for the customer. That's super important. So here's some graphical representations of antennas. We have this omnidirectional antenna. This is absolutely a unidirectional antenna focusing the energy in a certain direction. But you don't always know just by looking at a device. For example, this one right here, is it unidirectional or omnidirectional? And the answer would be you'd have to look at the specs for that specific device. Also notice it doesn't have little external antennae popping up. So as far as mounting these, should it be mounted on the wall or should you mount it flat on the ceiling? Again, it depends on the H plane and E plane, the documentation that came with it regarding the types of antennas that it has, because it does have antennas. They're just internal to the device. We physically can't see them. And as you see here, we have lots of shapes and sizes for antennas that we could use 
with RF. Let's take a look at an access point. He's a happy access point. You know why? Because he has two antennas to choose from. He's got one on the left and one on the right. Which one should he use? Well, diversity as it relates to antennas with Wi-Fi is if you have two antenna and one is getting a better signal than the other, why not use that? So this is, if this is A and this is B, and this guy has a slightly better or less noisy signal that he's seeing, let's go ahead and use that one. So diversity gives the access point the ability to choose which of its two antennas it's going to use for sending and receiving. One interesting note that I want to make about connectors in the world of access points and antenna is that most of the connections between the access point and the actual antenna, they are proprietary. Why is that? They're just trying to make it hard for us? Does company X just want us to buy company X antenna? Well, the answer is that the FCC is involved in a lot of that and they encourage proprietary connectors. That way you won't take the incorrect or an unallowed antenna and plug it into a certain type of gear to help keep your EIRP in check. So the thought is, if you're using vendor X's access point, as well as the same vendor's antennas, you'll be keeping that EIRP within the guidelines of the country that you currently live in. That's the thought. So let's say we have an access point right here, and this is the antenna that we wanna use. <laughs> so we have this cable that's connecting. Now we are gonna have some cable loss there, and if that cable is too big or too long, we might need to go ahead and insert an amplifier they just make sure that the signal by the time it gets to the antenna is at an appropriate level. Or if we have an access point that's generating too much power, the DBM coming out of the access point is too high, we may have an attenuator that is cutting back on that signal strength before it hits the antenna. Again, to keep it within regulation. Another thing that might be a great idea is if we have an outdoor antenna like this one, we might want to put in a lightning arrestor so that if lightning strikes, I'll do my best lightning strike here. And the intent is to use this lightning arrestor to help separate the damage that's being done to this antenna, which is going to be severe from also damaging our equipment that's sending the signals to that antenna. And if we had multiple antennas and we had the access point that supported a splitter, we could potentially have a connection coming off a splitter that goes off to two antenna. It would need to be one that's supported by the vendor's implementation, which would take into effect the transmit power being sent, the effective transmit power that'll be received at each antenna, as well as the antenna gain that each is gonna have to make sure they're in the limits set by the law. In this nugget, we've taken a look at antennas primarily for access points. It's also a good thing to understand that our wireless stations, our clients are also going to have antennas. If it's a laptop, it's embedded inside of the laptop or it's a desktop, we may have an external antenna, but those antennas are also going to affect the functionality between the client and the access point. I appreciate you spending this time with me. I've had a blast. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.